Uh, welcome uh, this afternoon uh, to our um, second COVID um, webinar. Uh, we know this is a very difficult time, uh, particularly in hot zones in America, New York being the biggest. Um, so we're all coping with difficult situations uh, at home with our families, with our employees. Uh, and uh, the purpose of this webinar is to keep people informed with some um, good facts and to help everybody try and navigate the future, the present and the future as we see it. Um, we have some terrific resources to help all of you do that. So we welcome all of our clients who've joined us today. Um, the format for today is pretty simple. I'll be giving an overview uh, of where we are in the epidemic. We will have uh, two fantastic guests with us today to talk about uh, where exactly we are and what, um, uh, where we find ourselves with respect to social distancing. Uh, we have Gail Roslo, who uh, participated in our last web webinar. She's a founding member of the International Society of Travel Medicine and the past president of the American Travel Health Nurses Association. She's a recipient of the Distinguished Nurse Leadership Award from the ISTM, and she is the 2020 recipient of the Cornell University New York Hospital Distinguished Alumnus Award. She's also a graduate of the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. Dr. Seema Sarin from EHE Health is one of our assistant medical directors, and she's a board certified physician in lifestyle medicine and a primary care physician, and she manages all of our lifestyle medicine uh, practice here, including our health mentorship program at EHE. She's an honors graduate of George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She finished her uh, internal medicine residency at Johns Hopkins uh, in, in Baltimore. Um, she will talk about some of the issues of not just social distancing, but the unfortunate consequences sometimes of social isolation. Um, We'll be answering your questions at the end of the webinar, so you should feel free to submit them throughout the webinar by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. After the webinar, please note that you and your employees should feel free to reach out to us via our COVID hotline. It's toll free, 844-258-1820. That's 844-258-1820. You've probably all seen it published elsewhere. Uh, or email us at the COVID-19 at ehe.health email address. Uh, our hotline is open for uh, you and all of your employees at, from 7 a.m. to 12 a.m. Uh, every day of the week. So um, with that, I'm just going to begin today's session with uh, an overview of where we are during, in this epidemic and how we've looked at trying to support not only our own company, but our clients through an evidence-based approach and to help us understand where we are, what we can do about it <clears throat> and what the future holds. So I'm going to share my screen right now and I've rehearsed this several times, so it should work. Um, and this is from some evidence which was published uh, this past weekend in the New York Times uh, from a wide variety of participants, but um, a uh, key was the, our partnership with the Mailman School of Public Health and some of the researchers there. And what you're looking at are three epidemic curves. Um, this is a national curve. Uh, and so this doesn't reflect New York or any particular place. And it's an average over the entire nation. But as you can see, the red line shows what would happen in a general condition where there were no social distancing activities taking place. The yellow curve, as I'm tracing here, shows what would happen with some moderate social uh, control measures, social distancing, and the low, low blue curve, what would happen if in fact there were severe control measures uh, with respect to social distancing, namely very restrictive movement. It's important to understand as you look at these curves that several weeks ago, and people called us terrible pessimists when we first started these um, webinars way back, way before February 21st, and we were preparing for this uh, for a long time, um, today, uh, uh, even though uh, I, I'm leading a preventive health company in my previous careers I'm, as an epidemiologist and as a partner at PwC, we got very involved 
in studying and looking at um, catastrophic situations. Particularly, we looked carefully and helped the government of Louisiana post-Katrina, and then led the team that uh, made the recommendations for the pandemic response for the state of California. So we've had a lot of experience looking at these kinds of epidemics and um, how they slowly build up and how they rapidly accelerate and how they peak. And much of what we're seeing today has been accurately predicted for several years in many models. So we at EHE Health believe that what's needed always is an evidence-based approach. Way back in early February, we started to prepare our business for what ultimately became a shutdown in New York City and elsewhere around the country. We put into place a whole host of preventive and management business continuity plans, not just with respect to off offsite, but to taking care of our employees on site. And what we've now entered into is a phase of very, very steep acceleration of this curve, and particularly uh, in New York City. Today, we only have really one mechanism for preventing this epidemic, and that's social distancing. There is, exists no immunization and none on the horizon, and there exists no antiviral therapy. And the only way, in fact, that we can slow and or ultimately prevent and defeat this ep epidemic today is through, um, is through social distancing. The next slide I'll show you is what that really looks like in other parts of the country. And this is from the same research that was published this past weekend. And as you can see, in various states, we can forecast what the epidemic looks like and exactly uh, when it peaks and when it moderates. The point here is, is this is not one national epidemic that all happens at the same time. It's highly dependent on when the first introduction of infection started, what the density and the interaction of the population is at, at any given site. So we're sitting right here during this epidemic. It's steep, steep increase. And unfortunately, in New York, we're going to see some very disturbing uh, situation evolve over the next week or 10 days. Maybe you've, some of you have already seen lines around the hospital and issues of real hospital shortages. And the idea right now is to have some significant social uh, distancing control to avoid this huge peak because it's this peak here that exceeds the hospital capacity and unfortunately can lead to people not getting the care they need, not getting into ICU admissions nor getting the ventilator requirements they need to support themselves as they recover uh, uh, through the virus. What's not mentioned here and what's not in these curves is the impact of testing. And before um, we jump into um, um, uh, our next speakers, I think it is important to um, clarify some of the um, confusing messages that have been sent out uh, from a wide variety of sources about testing. There is absolutely no question that testing is one of the most important ways to slow and potentially even stop this kind of an epidemic. You have to think about this, uh, if I could use a metaphor of thousands of horses stamp, stamping around in somebody's village. And if you went outside, what would ultimately happen is that somebody would get hurt by stampeding horses. If you could corral those horses and put them in a safe place, Clearly, as the, uh, they disappear, they would step outside and ultimately they, they would be able to you know, engage in normal life in a fairly safe way. Those countries that have had early and very um, extensive testing have been able to significantly reduce the impact of this epidemic. And the particular examples that I'm referring to are countries, are cities like Singapore and Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, as well as Korea. When we um, test and we test widely, we can identify early on exactly who has a disease and who doesn't corral them and make sure that they break the chain of transmission. It's a very important concept and particularly in light of, of an important article that was published last Monday in Science, uh, uh, which is co-authored by uh, some of our friends at the Mailman School of Public Health, which showed that in Wuhan, over 80% of people who got coronavirus were in fact transmitted that virus by somebody who was either asymptomatic or had no clue that they were even a carrier in any way. And so understanding the nature of who in your population has coronavirus, if they're COVID-19 positive or negative, is critical to reducing the rate of transmission and identifying those clusters of population who have the disease. Perhaps the most 
uh, uh, evidence of this kind of an impact is in northern Italy, where one city called Vo that had in, in northern Italy had early testing of the entire population has absolutely no problem, no almost no cases and no deaths in the epidemic. Whereas where testing wasn't available in other cities in Northern Italy, this epidemic has become rampant. So testing is a huge issue. And as we look at these epidemic curves, we believe at EHE Health as testing becomes widespread uh, throughout the country that we'll be able to lower the peaks of these curves and maybe even move the peak of the epidemic towards the left. In other words, peaking and ending earlier. Um, a, a last um, thought, with respect to uh, the testing and where we are, we're now here. We're here in the epidemic, as I said. In, a few, in two to four weeks, we believe we'll be on the downslope of the epidemic. And what we are doing at EHE Health now, and in response to some of our key employers, starting to think about how we can get our employees back to work. And this is another important issue because I was asked just yesterday by a large employer, is it okay to? Um, uh, for, for 14 days to isolate and then everybody goes back to work and is that fine and the answer is no it's not fine if in fact there's um, virus circulating the community it's only fine if you've tested um, if you've tested your employees and they're negative and they can enter into a safe work environment just before I go to Gail I want to just mention one last point we've had a lot of controversy people don't seem to understand um, the difference between testing for the use of public health and epidemic control versus testing for the use of diagnostics to be able to help individual patients. We heard over the past few days that both New York and LA have suspended testing for general population and only focused on testing for people who are very sick coming into the emergency rooms. This is a very important issue that's been driven by the shortage of testing. And so when somebody comes into the emergency room and has a sign of pneumonia, if that person has a pneumonia because of coronavirus versus a bacterial pneumonia that may be treated as an outpatient with an antibiotic, you need to know the difference about what kind of pneumonia the patient has. So that kind of suggestion and that kind of public health um, uh, 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 mandate inside of LA and inside of New York really relates to finding those patients who need appropriate admission to a hospital and potential ventilator support and isn't a reason why we shouldn't population health test. Point being that as the shortage of testing resolves itself, we will be moving and we believe in the next two to four weeks in a much more expansive testing regime, which we believe can serve um, uh, significantly with respect to uh, shortening the epidemic. The main message here is, is that this disease and this epidemic can be constrained with focus, with attention, and using the best of evidence. And we think that uh, that is ultimately going to happen with the testing regime. The last slide I'll show here is um, really um, uh, the kind of um, picture that you could imagine if there was no intervention and the kind of density of this epidemic across the country versus some control versus no control. And the big issue is not only, as you can see across our country, that the Testing, te the, the incidence significantly changes when we don't social um, distance, but also it changes differently from heavily urban versus rural communities. And again, this is and should be a part of an evidence-based approach to how we can um, control and end this epidemic uh, sooner rather than later. So that was intended just to be an overview of some of the uh, facts um, that um, uh, uh, we've, uh, we are faced with today. And I'm going to stop sharing this screen and now pass the um, mic or the webinar, as it were, to Gail. And we're really pleased and proud to have you with us. And uh, thank you for joining us and uh, giving us a view on what it really means to socially distance and what all the impact of that is on this epidemic. Thanks, Gail. Thank you, David. And um, thank you, EHE, because you are doing something that Unfortunately, not too many other organizations have done very well. You're trying to communicate con consistently, continuously throughout this pandemic. Um, I am sure everyone on this call has a reason to be anxious, has a reason to be fearful. Um, and um, without a drug, without a vaccine, without clear 
uh, cures. Um, we don't have pharmaceutical interventions. Um, David showed you the curve, showed you what we are facing. So what do we have? Well, as a nurse practitioner, um, two weeks ago, I was on one of these webinars, it seems like a hundred years ago, um, telling people they could travel and how they could travel safely. And I was teaching everybody to elbow bump. Well, elbow bumps are out. Social distancing is now the imperative. And so this afternoon, I'm gonna talk about three things. Um, really, what is social distancing? It is much more than just being six feet apart. I wanna talk about what evidence we have that it works. We're putting people through an awful lot of um, um, dislocation and it's important to know that it has value. And then finally, why does it matter? Why is it so important? And now, not in a week or two, not in a month or two, but right now. So I'm actually speaking to you from my home because as much as possible, I am trying to shelter in place. And I know many of you are listening to this webinar um, from your home. So what exactly is social distancing? As a public health person, I know that it is a technique. It is a public health technique, a means for stopping transmission, for trying to reduce the transmission of an infection. Um, it's a strange word, social distancing. Uh, a lot more people are calling it physical distancing. But um, the idea is that when you have a respiratory infection, something that can be passed by a cough or a sneeze, um, you want to keep that virus as far away from you as you can. Um, and so this term, which is, wasn't really known in this country realistically by many, um, not even just a month ago, is now the imperative um, technique that we have. Um, it actually isn't new, however. Um, there's evidence that social distancing was actually used in Europe in 16th century London. Um, and many of you have heard about the Spanish flu and, you know, there's been allusions that there's an element of what happened then in this country. And I just want to use that as, a, as an example because there is evidence um, coming out this week in a journal, um, Emerging Infectious Diseases. Um, there is a summary of the evidence that social distancing makes a difference. Now, I know most of us are used to taking a pill or taking a vaccine or other treatments, so some people are diminishing the power of this um, technique. But uh, the EID journal makes very clear that social distancing matters. Um, the Spanish flu took hold when World War I soldiers were coming home. Everybody was very happy the war was over. They wanted to celebrate. There were parades all around the country. Philadelphia planned a big parade. But at the same time, they started to see that there was this flu that was deadly. It was killing people. They made the decision to continue to have this massive parade downtown. By the end of the week, 4,500 Philadelphians who had attended that parade were dead. St. Louis also wanted to celebrate their soldiers, their heroes. They made a very different decision. They canceled the parade. They canceled many, many group activities. They told people, stay indoors. And they were able to spare more than half of their citizens from that same consequence. It does work. So what does it mean to practice social distancing? Well, it's four steps. And step number one is if you have anybody in your life who is in the at-risk group, anybody who is vulnerable, an older person, someone with heart disease, diabetes, uh, emphysema, a respiratory condition, or maybe it's a child with cystic fibrosis or a family member who's pregnant, or it's someone who's just going through chemotherapy. They need to stay indoors. They need to be isolated. They cannot go out and be exposed to this virus. That is critical. Support them in any way you can with services so they don't have to go into the community. That's step one. Step two is if you have symptoms, coughing, sneezing, shortness of breath, fever, or you have tested positive and still feel really fine, please don't go outside. Please don't spread the virus. We wanna protect the vulnerable from contracting the virus and we wanna stop the sick and the positive patients from spreading the virus. 
And I will use the example of Senator Ron Paul. He should not have gone to the Senate. He should not have been in the gym and in the cafeteria. Um, many of his fellow senators are, are criticizing him. As a physician, that was absolutely the wrong thing to model. So protect our vulnerable, isolate the sick and the positive cases. The third step the government is taking, but it needs your cooperation. The government has closed workplaces, closed concert halls, closed theaters, closed parks, closed amusement parks but citizens seem to still be finding a way to congregate outside. Over the weekend, we saw individuals who were forming soccer teams, individuals that were crossing state lines to go to bars. In other words, finding ways to do what they've always done. And that's understandable. We wanna do what we've always done, but this pandemic requires us to take very drastic measures and to take them now. So please, please, follow government guidelines and restrict these kinds of gatherings. Put off your child's birthday party or do it virtually. I've really gotten into virtual happy hours. I've, I'm having a great time at six o'clock every night with my friends across the country. It's a, not a substitute for the real thing, but for right now it's the substitute we have. And the fourth and final piece does speak to six feet. If you are well, stay home but you might have to go out for essential things like foods or a pharmacy, or some of you are essential employees and you need to work. That doesn't mean that you can't also try to separate yourself from this droplet infection. Six feet isn't easy. I've had people walk up towards me. I've had people dodge around me. Um, I have to go off the curb. I have to back up. I have to put my hands up. There's all sorts of ways that we have to try to maintain the six foot rule. But what does it mean? It means that if they were to cough or sneeze, hopefully I would then not have it enter my system through my eyes, my nose, or my mouth. Now, David has made it very clear. We know that there's asymptomatic transmission. You can't look at a person and know who's infected. And so, you know, in, in healthcare, we take a position called universal precautions. We make the assumption that everybody is infected. And if we all make the assumption that we are all infected, well, we'll be sparing those vulnerable people, the people in our lives that make uh, such a difference to us. So why is this important? Well, it's important for three reasons. You saw the curve of the infection. If social distancing can flatten that curve, that's the new, the new terminology now, flatten that curve, what does it mean? It means that we can slow the rate of infection. If we slow the rate of infection, two things happen. The first is we have time to get those tests out there. We have the time to find out who's infected so we can isolate them, quarantine them. Remember, social distancing is isolation, it's quarantine, and it's community containment. If we practice social distancing, we can separate those individuals for a sufficient period of time so they're not spreading the virus. Secondly, it takes pressure off of the healthcare system. I was just called by a local hospital to come help set up something here in Westchester County. They're anticipating the need to bring nurses who function in every community setting uh, to bear on this pandemic. You wanna know that if you or one of your loved ones gets sick, that there will be a bed, there will be a ventilator, there will be healthcare professionals there for you. Social distancing is what you can do to be sure that that system is um, there for you. And then finally, um, social distancing, if we have cases kind of go out over time, gives all of those labs that are working so hard a chance to test to see if chloroquine has any value, to test to see if there are new drugs that we can be using to work on the vaccine. So in other words, we're taking the pressure off of the healthcare system, we're reducing the spread in the community, and we're giving research time to come up with the kinds of cures that won't make social distancing necessary anymore. We don't have a pharmaceutical intervention for this coronavirus right now, but we do have social distancing. So I'd like to close by calling this what 
Andrew Cuomo is calling it. And for those of you who aren't New Yorkers, he is our governor. Um, he's every day on the, on the TV talking to us. He stopped calling it social distancing. He gave it a name and he gave it a face. He calls it Matilda's Law. And he calls it Matilda's Law because Matilda is his 88-year-old mother. And Andrew Cuomo, every time he goes to sit down next to somebody or he decides that he needs to go outside or he wants to have a meeting, he thinks about six feet, he thinks about isolation, he thinks about quarantine, but most importantly, he thinks about his mother, Matilda. I think if all of us look at social distancing with a name, with a face, maybe it's Joe, maybe it's your niece, maybe it's your mother, as an act of compassion, you know that you can be doing something to stop this pandemic and get us past this. There will be a future, but what we do today can make that future happen a lot, a lot sooner. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gail. Seema, what's all this social distancing do to us? Um, yes, the social distancing um, is something that we have to do, uh, uh, you know, as you all have uh, said very eloquently, it's important to flatten the curve. It's, a, it's an act of compassion uh, to everyone around us. Um, but you want to maintain social distancing without be becoming socially isolated. Um, you want to be able to keep in touch virtually with your friends and family using ways like telephone calls, video conferencing, and text messaging, because those positive emotions uh, community and they arise from even brief virtual social connections. So I know it's not the normal way we do things as Gail so uh, eloquently said, but it's our new way until we can get a control of this, um, this pandemic and flatten the curve and keep everyone safe. Um, yes, and a few things that I'd like to mention too, when we're socially distancing, there are many positives to socially distancing. You know, obviously it helps flatten the curve, um, but it also uh, protects many people from getting the disease at once. It allows us to have the opportunity um, to reflect on the ways that we normally do things. Um, it can improve, we can improve our daily habits, for example. Um, we can uh, recognize our feelings. Oftentimes, many of my patients right now are feeling stressed and overwhelmed. Um, we can use self-reflection to kind of determine the cause. Um, I've noticed many people being stressed from all the troubling news through social media and news outlets that we're receiving. Um, instead of reading through all of this, limit your time with, with social media and the news and concentrate on solid sources of information like from the World Health Organization or the Centers of Disease Control. Um, you want to get the facts, but you want to not get rumors or misinformation. Um, another thing to do is to cultivate that social support and uh, get creative. Um, in my neighborhood, we've organized a service to run errands for older adults, for example. Um, you know, really reach out to the community that's at highest risk. Because when we um, show and studies show that when we help people in need, it improves our own health as well. Um, you want to take good care of yourself, seek good nutrition, exercise regularly, um, time to get physical, go out in nature, for example, get some vitamin D, um, and keep your pleasurable activities. Oftentimes when we're stressed, um, that's the first one to go. So you want to learn a new skill, try meditation, deep breathing. Um, it can really make a big impact as we face with the new realities of wanting to protect ourselves and our loved ones. Thank you, Seema and Gail. Um, we're going to have we're going to open now for uh, questions. We're all getting used to Zoom here in our company, so I apologize. <laughs> everyone. At least our kids haven't, grandchildren haven't jumped up, or my dog usually jumps up and said, hey, what are these funny things these two-legged creatures are up to these days? Um, so I'll give everybody a chance now to uh, answer, uh, to ask some questions. Um, and all you have to do is hit the Q&A button and they will come into me. Um, I have a first question here. Um, is it reasonable to assume that everybody should be going back to work by Easter and the economy being opened up again? Um, so, okay, that's a great first question. Um, let me take a shot at that answer um, by sharing my screen again and showing you this. Whoops. Can everybody see that now? Okay. Yep. Um, so what we're looking at here is these traditional uh, epidemic curves. And um, 
you know, we're at this phase of the curve and we will ultimately peak and will come down. Um, candidly, it makes no sense and it's probably highly irresponsible to think about people congregating again in the steep upslope of any one of these curves. It, it's just unthinkable to want to be able to do that. Gail alluded to it perfectly well. It's just not Matilda's law. It's really, really, you know, not pressuring the healthcare system to respond appropriately. I, and, and, and so the answer is, I think employers can start to think about, and this is on an evidence-based way, to start thinking about bringing back employees as a curve down slopes. And as we have additional testing and we have quarantining of those who are positive. Now, um, the, the, the next question that you have to answer is, does that mean everybody goes back all at the same time? And so hopefully the chart that I showed earlier explains this, which is that every part of the country has is it a little bit of a different stage of this epidemic. So if you were a national employer and you said, okay, May 1st, everybody goes back to work, is that a terribly thoughtful thing to say? I would assert that it's not a terribly thoughtful thing to say. I think in every community, you have to look at what work the community is on this epidemic curve and think about a thoughtful way to bring people back as you're down part of the downslope of the curve. Every community will be different and every community will in fact have a different testing regime in place and abundance of tests. And that will be, that will be the answer will be given on a case by a case basis. So that's the answer to this. And so do I, do I think uh, Easter is soon enough? I think no, but to go back to work, I think we'll still be on the upslope. And two, do I think everybody goes back at the same time? No, I think that really relates to where we are in any given uh, community. So that was the first one. There seems to be, the next one is, there seems to be confusion around social distancing. Is it okay to go for walks, working outside if you are alone, what if you live in a city and naturally there will be other people also going on walks? Um, so um, I actually live right next to the High Line in New York and they actually closed the High Line, which I never thought would happen other than a snowstorm. But I think the best person to answer that question is Gail. Uh, and I understand why they closed the High Line, unfortunately. The High Line is, if anybody has been on it, knows that it's only about maybe 20 feet wide. So it's pretty hard if three people are walking on the High Line to keep a distance of six feet between you. But absolutely you can go out. In a city, and I have lived in New York City, it's gonna be creative walking, okay? There's even been some talk of closing certain streets so people could start walking in the street. I'm not recommending that today, but if they did close the street. Uh, but certainly a park, certainly an area where you can realistically um, separate yourself by six or more feet. So over the weekend, I went into an area called Rockwood with a friend and the two of us kept six feet apart and we encountered more people at Rockwood than I've ever encountered in 20 years here in Westchester. But all of us were kind of doing this dance. As we would walk, we would see somebody coming and we'd step back or we'd step forward or we'd pull apart. Um, it is doable. And I think it's very important. I'm sure Seema will emphasize with me that getting out in nature, uh, you know, just seeing your dog, David, on these slides is a positive thing. It reminds us of what's wonderful about life and that we don't have to deprive ourselves of everything, but six feet of distancing will make the difference. Okay, super. So I have the next question. I think you let Dr. Saren take this, Seema. And that is um, isolation. We talk about social isolation, but uh, uh, it, the question says, people, some people are really going crazy. What do you do resource-wise? How do you detect early? What kind of support can we give for them? And where are uh, some of the resources out in the community, particularly since nobody can get to anybody? How would, we, how would you uh, address that? Yes, that's a great question. And uh, kudos to you for thinking about how to help everyone else and how to understand 
um, the kind of mental health issues that can arise when we're socially distancing ourselves. Um, but keeping in mind not to isolate yourself and withdraw from the community. You still want to be a part of the community, um, but be able to reach out uh, through virtual means. So video conferencing, text messaging, um, you picking up the phone and talking to loved ones. You want to know the people around you and what their normal state of health is and their, their way of communicating and being with others. Um, are they uh, having a different demeanor? Are they um, anxious or overly worried? Are they exhibiting uh, different behavior like not being on time for things, um, not co coming into work, for example? Um, you want to recognize these things in your friends and family, coworkers. And if you do find that they're having an issue or you're concerned, um, talking to them about that, about what your concerns are in kind of a non non-judgmental, compassionate way. Um, not saying maybe, you know, oh, you seem depressed, for example, or avoiding um, stigmatizing terms like you're crazy and things like that. You want to say, hey, you don't feel, seem like yourself um, and allow that space and that compassionate uh, environment for them to speak up and talk to you about their concerns. Um, there are many resources right now uh, to reach out to others. If they need help, um, you can uh, talk to your your primary care doctor, for example. They have, uh, many doctor uh, primary care doctors have telemedicine capability. Um, look at your EAP programs at work. Your employer oftentimes will set up uh, wonderful resources for you to reach out to through telemedicine. There's doctors on demand, teledoc. American Well, there's many different companies that offer these telemedicine services. Um, there's also different websites like the World Health Organization and the Centers of Disease Control um, that you can reach out to in times of, of need or if you need more resources. Um, so there's many different ways to do so. Super. I'd also add that um, in our, uh, on our EHE um, COVID-19 support yeah. lines, <laughs> Um, uh, you know, not only are we taking active questions from lots of people, we're actually setting up appointment times for all of our providers. As you all know, our clinics are closed. So we have about 50 doctors and about 40 nurses uh, backing this line and taking half hour appointments to talk, to help our patients and our members uh, get through some of these uh, really difficult uh, times. Um, the other thing I would add, and I, I'd say this to Gail Seaman, to the folks on the phone is, um, you know, over communicate. Um, you know, you yes. know, we all have we all have family. Uh, you know, we all many of us have elderly patients. Call them every single day. You know, even yeah. if there's nothing to talk about, just call them every single day. Is that a good advice, Doctor Saren? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I it's my son's birthday today, and we're having a little virtual birthday party. So we invited all of all of his friends to a Zoom meeting. Um, and we're all getting together and blowing out a cake and we're going to see a movie. There's a lot of creative ways you can, can do this. So that everyone's going to start the movie at the same time. Um, we'll, have, we'll stop for, you know, snacks for everyone um, to, to do at their own home. And that way you're having a shared experience and you're able to connect with others, you know, on a fun kind of different level um, than, you're, than you're used to. So, yes, being in touch, being overly in touch. Even at work, you know, um, have a text group. What, what we do is we just say good morning to each other, check in. Um, over communication is a, is a great way um, to, to connect and, and to understand where everybody is. And I just want to thank you, Dr. Saren, for inviting everybody on this webinar to your son's virtual birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, next, the next question is from, the next question is, is complete, it's from VJ. Ramachandran, is complete isolation possible in a household? To what extent is it practically possible to self-isolate in a family with a different degree of needs, assuming your symptoms are mild and no prior travel history? I'm going to, before I let Gail answer that, this is actually an emerging area of controversy because one of the best practices that has come out of Asia is, and what we have seen is that this thing actually passes inside of clusters. And a lot of the people who tested positive were actually isolated from their family and put into places where there were just COVID-19 uh, positive folks and in other parts of the world. And so this is a very complicated question because this does, this will cluster in families very strongly. So having teed that up for you, Gail, try and unwind <laughs> me from that. Well, um, your caller is absolutely right. Um, depending upon how much space you have 
for your household. Um, this is a goal, but it may not be a reality. Um, you can only do what you can do. Now, if you're fortunate enough to have, um, you know, live on several levels, several, uh, you know, a two-story house, if you're fortunate to have um, bedrooms that you can shut a door, if you're fortunate to have multiple bathrooms where you can designate a bathroom. In other words, the goal is to try to put that distance between you and members of your household, to not use the same bathroom facilities, to not use the same eating facilities, um, to recognize that any amount of effort you can make to protect that distance so when you are coughing and you are sneezing, or even if you're not coughing or sneezing, there are people walking around that are positive or saying, I feel fine, I, I was shocked that I was positive. Um, you're still practicing social distancing. Now, as I said, if you live with your partner in a 500 square foot studio in Manhattan, that is a challenge that cannot possibly um, meet the same level of, of commitment. But you're doing the best you can. And by staying indoors there, you're at least preventing someone on the elevator or someone in the laundry room or someone in the lobby from um, having an expression of the spread of the virus. I right. hope that, I know it's, I know it's hard. This is, you know, uh, it's hard. Saying, it, oh, it is. Yeah. It's very hard. Um, mm -hmm. I would, uh, this is, comes from a client. Uh, clients would like to know when and if we will be providing, that's EHE, uh, COVID-19 testing, and if so, this will be available to all or only to those who have had an EHE health exam. That's a great question. So uh, we are actually very much in the throes of designing a return to work product for all of our clients, uh, which will include hopefully uh, COVID-19 testing. Our clinics are closed now. The whole country is basically focusing on acute care, and it's and it's prudent to keep people away from the healthcare system. But as the slope of this curve uh, comes downward, we are absolutely prepared to do that. We don't want to endanger any community by uh, uh, taking in or purchasing um, uh, uh, tests that may be in short supply. But we will be having a complete return to work um, uh, uh, maintenance and uh, management program which will be customized for every single employer. Uh, the truth is, if in fact uh, people have been self have been self quarantining or people have been um, uh, staying in place for 14 days, and you are in a community where there's been virtually no COVID experience, in other words, there is no epidemic and there's a very low level, it's probably okay to be able to go back to work without having a COVID-19 test. And in fact, probably just to take temperatures. And then if somebody had a positive temperature to jump on, get the test and, and, and surround those patients. However, in a relatively urban environment, it makes a lot of sense to have COVID-19 uh, testing. And so we will be uh, providing and we will be actually responding to the moment at EHE Health by adding another service on top of our traditional uh, EHE Health exam uh, which is a shortened exam plus a COVID-19 test to try and accommodate everybody uh, and, um, and, and enabled in our uh, entire national network. So we'll be able to service the whole country. So uh, we'll be, you, hopefully our clients will be hearing more about that in the coming one to two weeks. Already we've recruited a couple of our clients to participate with us in shaping this product and uh, you'll hear more about it from us soon for our clients. Um, the next question is, do you, we know why Italy was hit so hard? Northern Italy is affluent with good medical care. So this is the um, reality of epidemics. It really doesn't matter how good your acute medical care facilities are because un unless you have uh, um, antiviral medication or, or uh, immunization, the fact of the matter is this is a public health problem, not an acute care problem. Um, I, was, I spent a long time on the phone yesterday with Dr. Jeffrey Shaman. He was one of the key researchers who published the paper in Science and the curves that I showed you from the New York Times. And we discussed at length um, what happened in China and then what happened in Northern Italy. Really, um, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Wuhan, China has a very close relationship with uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Northern Italy. And it actually relates to the, um, to the industries, to the... Um, um, 
Italian designers. The, the design industry, but you know, the fabric industry mm -hmm. and the like. And what has happened and what was going on was there's um, the Chinese New Year happened. There were lots of Chinese workers in Italy. They came back to Wuhan and vice versa. There was a massive amount of travel between, um, uh, chi between Wuhan, China and uh, Northern Italy well before any of these recommendations uh, were put into place. And so the original hot zone, which was Wuhan, was kind of hypercharged, I call it fuel injected, into Northern Italy. And so you had a massive amount of virus load through people being poured into that community. That is not what has happened in the United States. In the United States, we have had random people coming from around the world in a wide variety of cities, and it's built up in a completely different way. There hasn't been one single place, although perhaps people could say, well, New York being such a center for travel for all over the world, but there hasn't been a fuel injection of virus into America the same way that it was injected into Northern Italy. And that's why it, it had that. And, and frankly, once you, and frankly, it doesn't matter how great your health insurance system is. It doesn't matter how great your, uh, your healthcare system is, the truth is, is that 2% of the people are likely going to be, are, 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 there's a case fatality of 2% of the people, 10 to 15% are going to require admission. And in a public health emergency, no matter how great your healthcare system is, no healthcare system is prepared for that kind of volume. So you rapidly surge, you rapidly exceed the capacity and the heartbreaking pictures that are coming out of Northern Italy, of just bodies being stacked up. And it's basically because this virus rapidly outran the supply of what is excellent medical care. So you can't buy your way out of this thing by having great care. You can only buy your way out of this thing by investing in prevention. And I cannot say that strongly enough. Um, I hope I answered that. Uh, are we modeling more like South Korea with fewer cases, deaths, or likely Italy? So the question here is, do we look like South Korea or Italy? I alluded to that. Um, and, uh, and it really relates to the testing regimen and the availability of testing. What makes Korea different is this massive investment in early identification and testing of everybody or as many people as possible. You don't have to test everybody. As long as you get a good statistical sample of the population of where the clusters are, you can be really good at preventing the spread of the epidemic. Now, I mentioned this small city Vo in, Vo, called Vo in Northern Italy, where they tested everybody. And there it is sitting as an island of low incidence in a massive sea of high incidence. And that all relates to the amount of testing that was done. I cannot stress this enough. When I spoke to Dr. Shin yesterday on the phone, we could, you know, he said, you know, testing, 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 testing. More you test, the better you are. And by the way, for those who are interested, I just reviewed a great comprehensive review of the problem in multiple dimensions, economic, public health, and policy and the like from the London School of uh, Business. And happy to submit that to you. Um, strongly suggesting the more testing you can do, and remember, 80% of all cases are transmitted by people who aren't sick or don't know who they have the disease. And the only way to know who they are is to test, test, and test. So that's the difference between South Korea and Italy. And the difference about where we will land in America is how much we test and how seriously we take social um, uh, distancing. And the big message to this question is, it's really up to us. Uh, we, we should not anthropomorphize this virus. Honestly, I, I tell this to people, this is just math. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. math. Mm -hmm. This virus has no personality. This virus has no preference. This is just math and contacts. Um, next one. If you have been sheltered in place and you're over 65 <laughs> and your children and grandchildren have been socially distancing, but not to as great an extent outside bike riding, seeing neighbors at a distance, marketing when necessary. At what point is it safe to have them over? So I think I'll give that question to Gail. You me, can you uh, see the question, Gail? I don't know if you can see the questions as I can. It, it doesn't matter. I can't, but I get that question about 10 times a day. <laughs> okay. And as we approach Passover and as we approach Easter and as the time goes by, 
many, many grandparents are saying, I want to see the new baby, I want to be there for the birthday party, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can't. We can't. We've got to practice social distancing. The fact of the matter is if we all commit to this, as painful as it might be in terms of waiting to see your precious grandchild, we can move that curve. We can get to the other side of the curve that David has shown us. Um, you know, if you can have them sit on a porch and you can stand in the middle of the street and have the grandchildren just looking at them, well, then that's six feet and that's fine. But I'm finding that most grandparents go, oh, I, I can't do that. I want to hug them. I want to hold them. I want to play with them. And of course, that's who we are as human beings. So um, I'm sorry I have to say that. Um, I have loved ones that I am eager, eager to kiss. And it's going to be a while until, as you said, until we have the testing, until we've identified um, and isolated. Um, and the more we do right now to do that, the sooner the answer can be yes. Thanks, Gail. Um, I, I just want to talk about, in this regard to this question, a very interesting study about one of the reasons why people feel that Italy has been so hard hit, particularly Northern Italy. So, particularly with fatalities. Um, so one is that Italy happens to be the oldest country in Europe from an age point of view, so there's a much greater density. But I did see this fascinating study yesterday. I think Gail May must have seen it, she's nodding, mm -hmm. where actually Italian people over the age of 65 or 70 have much greater social contact because of the nature of community with younger people. In other words, grandchildren visit their grandparents much more often in Italy, and they've actually measured this as it relates to incidences of social contact. And um, that's one of the reasons why people feel it's so widespread, because Italy as a culture is that kind of a culture. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, don't, uh, you know, they tend to, as they age, stay at home. There tends to be a lot of family support. And so there's actually some good math that's showing that, yes, indeed, all of those interactions and those many, many interactions with younger people and older people in fact, has significantly contributed to the problem that we're seeing in Unfortunately. Italy. Yeah, unfortunately. So uh, this idea and your recommendation, Gail, is actually really starting to become supported by some mathematical models and some evidence in that regard. Um, so here's a question that I don't know the answer to, but I will read it anyway. <laughs> uh, there, was an <laughs> there was an internet report. I'll stop right there. Uh, <laughs> an internet report saying that if a person were to ingest the virus, that their stomach acid would kill it <laughs> before it would infect the person. Is that true? Or if the virus gets into the digestive system, would the person still be as vulnerable? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'll ask Gail or Seema to answer that if they know. But I would like to talk about two things as it relates to susceptibility to this virus this, this brings up. Um, one question that we have been asked a lot, does temperature, climate, right. Right. Um, um, have anything to do with the transmissibility of the virus? And most people were saying that it, we don't know and there's no reason to suspect it does or it doesn't. But actually, there was a study, and this was not peer reviewed yet, that I saw yesterday that showed that um, there indeed is a peak incidence around a certain temperature, which is something like in the, you know, uh, I can't remember exactly, but in the moderately cool to moderately warm, but mm -hmm. the, the incidence is not quite as high in very cold and very warm climates. Mm -hmm. Now this is an early paper and I don't know if this will be substantiated by peer review and the like, but people are looking at this question. And if that were to be the case, um, I think it's good news, I guess, for Antarctica. Uh, <laughs> and, but if, in fact, we're moving into summer into the Northeast, you know, that may be some early good news. This is, I have not seen this repeated. This, I, this is an early paper, and I don't think it's been peer reviewed yet, but um, I did see a, a, this as a formal report uh, through one of the listservs. Um, and then the second thing as it relates to this uh, uh, question people have asked, are people immune after they get it and will they ever, do they get lifelong immunity? Well, that's an interesting question. Most people feel that there will be 
some long-lasting immunity and that serology, namely checking for antibodies, will indeed um, help because people will not be able to get it again. That's kind of where I thought the evidence was leaning until I spoke to Dr. Shaman on the phone and he said that there's some early papers that there may be some short-term immunity, mm -hmm. but the coronaviruses may not have confer long-term immunity. And so in terms of back to work or in terms of how to manage this, um, I, I would say possibly serology can help in antibody testing, but I wouldn't say that that is a for sure thing at all. So I will leave it now to Gail and to Seema to answer the question about, does your stomach kill this stuff? Seema, do you know, or Gail, do you know, or do you have any, Seema, do you have any idea to the answer to that question? Let's let Seema take it first. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, what I've read is that you can have viral shedding um, any, you know, through the GI tract as well. Um, but primarily, we would worry about, you know, um, of course, um, exposure to the and eyes and mouth um, and that and getting into the system that way. Um, in terms of stomach acid, it may break it down, um, just physiologically speaking, but I, I haven't read any studies particularly about, about this topic. Okay, the next question is, um, will, there's a lot of questions, so we maybe go a little bit past three if that's okay. Uh, will there be a test for those of us who may have unknowingly had the virus and now have the antibodies that we're able to make maybe at home so that we can go back to normal life? So the answer to that question is the FDA has recently licensed some new testing, a home test, and what we call a point of care test. The home test, you would take a swab of your nasopharynx and then send it in and wait until you get a result back. A point of care test would be it's right on the spot and you get the answer within 45 minutes. I, I will just tell you, um, you know, we've at EHE Health tried to get blood testing and stuff in advance by people doing their own pinpricks on their thumbs or their fingers. Um, for those of you who don't know what a nasopharyngeal swab is, it's like this little thin wire that you put way, way down in the back of your nose to hit your pharynx. It's kind of the place that when you talk and you eat spaghetti, as I see my kids do spaghetti, starts to come out of their mouth. I can't really imagine how people are going to do proper, nas proper nasopharyngeal swabs at home, although you know, I see no reason why it couldn't be done, but it's not a very comfortable test. However, I'm really, I, I really think that we're gonna get a lot of point of care testing flooding the market, which would be really great. But I would caution that person, going back to a normal life is not really just related to you having a negative test. That doesn't confer you the ability to go back to a normal life. The normal life relates to what's going on in your community. That's what a normal life is about. And it's if everybody in your community has a negative test or is being tested, and for those who get sick are isolated, that's what a normal life starts to look like. And this is a big fallacy. Just because you have a negative test doesn't mean you may be safe in a place that has no coronavirus, of course, and that makes sense. But if you walk back into a community where, in fact, I mean, it's the same thing about returning to work. I mean, if you return to work and there's still coronavirus at your workplace, Right. I mean, people come out to work, you open a factory and boom, it's again. And so this idea of a test is only useful for an individual at the hospital door, whether they need to be admitted to the ICU. It's much more a public health um, uh, vehicle to understand if your communities are safe. And I, I cannot say that strongly enough and distinguish the difference strongly enough. How long can the virus stay on surfaces? Um, Seema or Gail, do you want to answer that? <laughs> um, I'm glad to answer it. We know that um, it stays on surfaces for different periods of time. And there's actually lists now. Uh, copper supposedly is the most resistant and uh, cardboard, who knows? Uh, people are asking about the pizza box that gets delivered. Um, I know everybody is concerned. We call them fo fomites and we're talking about surfaces and people are disinfecting surfaces. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that we don't have, you know, one chart that tells you exactly um, how much time. We do know it can persist. And so that's the reason for hand washing, because if you touch the surface, you want to properly hand wash. And that's a reason for disinfecting uh, surfaces like your cell phone that you use frequently. 
um, but it can persist, but from various times frames. Okay. Thank you. There's two more questions and I'm going to have to kind of stop this because they keep coming. The more questions that are asked. Are there any other <laughs> hotspots in Europe that are, doing, that are doing things right or wrong? Germany and Spain comes to mind. Well, you know, we've, it's an incredibly difficult situation in Spain. It's, it's yeah. less difficult than Germany. I think that if you get down to the bottom of it, I just read a report this morning, the difference between Germany and Spain is probably the prevalence of testing and uh, contact tracing. Mm -hmm. And so again, we're back to this idea of the importance of tests, of not just social distancing, uh, but of testing. And this is going to be the last question, and I'm sorry for everybody else. Um, and this is from an anonymous attendee who says, this is from my wife. So uh, we'll take that, obviously. Is it true that seventh day mark from day of exposure is critical, i.e. either you can go from zero to nothing or recover? Considering there's no preventive testing in the US, is complete prevention of cases possible? So let me take that. Um, so everybody needs to understand in the theoretical sense, if there was no testing and everybody stayed home for two weeks in this entire country, this thing would go away. And if there were no inputs from any other country, so, uh, it would go away. So the virus would either kill the host in 2% of times, or the host would kill the virus in 98% of the times, period. No contact with anybody, nobody moves, everybody stays at home for two weeks, this thing goes away. Now, the amount to which we social distance, the amount we test and find people is that which tends to mitigate that optimal scenario because we live in a much more complex world. And that's how you get from that zero probability to where we are today. And um, that answers the question, is it theoretically possible? The answer is yes, but it's practically impossible unless we have social distancing and testing. And then there's this medical question, which is the seventh day mark a day of exposure is critical. Uh, either you can go from zero to nothing or recover. Um, you know, we know that the reason people have bad outcomes from this disease uh, tends to be uh, towards the latter part of disease. The first four, few days, um, you know, people have a normal course. And then for some reason, there's a massive, it appears to be autoimmune response. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. happens somewhere in the seventh day or onward. And um, I, uh, there's no real predictive model on if you will get it, but we know that there are significant risk factors around when, if in fact it goes on to much more lethal stage. And those are the ones that I described earlier, which are um, uh, uh, hypertension, um, uh, diabetes, and uh, heart disease. I mean, it's an astonishing fact, and I, and I didn't see this peer reviewed, I did see it in Bloomberg, that oh, something like 95, 99% of fatalities in Italy were with people who had one of those three conditions. And 75% of all fatalities were from people who had two of hypertension. That's right. So um, you're, the, the, the question is exactly correct. And we do know that, it, that it, it's after several days that it will move into a particularly lethal phase. And it's those people with those underlying conditions plus age, which is probably related to those conditions who are at risk. So I'm going to end this now, if it's uh, all right with everybody. I think we've had a good hour and six minutes together. I want to thank Gail and Seema and for all the folks at uh, EHE who remotely have uh, helped us put this together, including sending to my home this fantastic background that you see uh, right now, received about a half an hour before so that you don't have to see uh, pictures of my dogs uh, all over the place. And, um, you know, I, I just want to say to every and to the clients who've joined, I want to say this is a really tragic, tragic time in our country. And we all appreciate it, how difficult, how difficult it is. But we will get through this. This epidemic will peak. There will be a tomorrow and a day after tomorrow, and it's time for us, I think all as leaders, to keep our hands steady on the tiller, do what we can that's within our control, and we will see the end of this. We will for surely see the end of this, and there's no question in my mind that just in a few months, we won't be here talking about this in the way we are. 
we'll be talking about um, we'll, we'll be talking about it in a completely different way. I will just um, uh, reiterate that we do have our hotline, our COVID hotline. It's free and open to everybody on this call and clients, employees, beneficiaries. They don't have to have had an EHE exam. It's 844-258-1820. And it's open 7 a.m. till midnight every single day of the week. And then our hotline email, which is answered around the clock, is covid-19 at ehe.health. So with that, I'm going to thank everybody. And um, um, we will probably be organizing another one for two weeks' time. And the more feedback we get on how you found this helpful or not, the better we can be next time to try and answer your questions. So thank you very much, everybody.